Boning up on some knowledge for some complex transactions. What type of transactions are so complex in our market? Oh, nothing's really all that complex when you get right down to it. It's nothing that years and years of experience can't solve. And a little misery and suffering. It's true. So, I think we should talk about foreclosures. Ah, that special beast that yeah. is the bank owned property. You know, I actually, honestly, I really love foreclosures. Like, more than half of what I've done this year is foreclosures. And I have learned to love them. It's good for the buyers. Yeah, it's just, the only thing is, is especially if you bought a house before, understanding that the process of buying a foreclosure is going to be a little different. And can be a little than bit frustrating. buying a normal house. Yeah. If, it's frustrating if you don't know what to expect. Right. Personally, I have come to sort of love the institutional aspect. Like... The sterility? Yeah, nobody's getting their nose out of joint when you ask for something or when you offer a little low. They just counter it. But there's, but, no, there's no dramas. But buyers can get a little bit excited unless they know what to expect. And that's what we're right. hoping to shed a bit of light on, right? Yes. About the process. So I'm just going to just do a quick breakdown on like how a foreclosure happens just so we can talk about... Kind of, there, there's some misconceptions about what buying a foreclosure is. Or what, yeah, what is it an REO? Is yeah. Is it a foreclosure? Is like it a bank loan? Is it the courthouse steps? Like, let's, let's talk about that. Okay. So, uh, if a person doesn't make their house payment, um, they'll go to, link, their mortgage will go delinquent, they're going to get all those notices on the door that all the news stations like to take videos of when they talk about how horrible everything is, and then it will go, they'll have a foreclosure date, and on that date, that's when the whole truck auction at the courthouse yes. steps thing happens. And while there are some people out there that have a business of buying houses in that situation, we are not going to talk about that today because it's incredibly complex, and you're legally angry. fraught, and you have to pay cash. Actually, you pay with cashier's checks in the exact amount. So people go down there with like $10,000 cashier checks. Your typical home buyer is not going to buy an auction at the courthouse cash? steps. Nor would they want to because, you know, they probably won't have all of the resources to deal with the title issues, right. the liens, all of that stuff. You, you want to leave that to the professionals or get like really lawyered up. Okay. So let's talk about what happens after that auction. Because a lot of times it doesn't sell at auction. Some investor doesn't swoop in right. and, and buy it there. So what does the bank do then? Well, in many cases, they buy it back essentially. Mm -hmm. And so then the period, one of the things we're seeing is the period of time between the auction and when it gets relisted on the market, which is when we can sell the property to you. It varies. It's, but it's shorter. I mean, it is it shorter. Like they're starting to turn them around more quickly. It's and true. so we do have some resources where we can see that a property is scheduled for yeah. auction because that's all recorded in public record. Mm -hmm. So it comes up, it goes, and then eventually it comes back on to the MLS. So the bank is going to actually list it with a real estate agent and it will go on the MLS. So it'll be on all the websites on the internet just like normal right. as a bank owned house. Right. So it, it's not like you have to do anything special to find them. A lot of, a lot of, Agents don't fall for that business where you uh, sign up for something online. We're gonna get you foreclosures, foreclosures kids. Not no. necessary. Everybody has the foreclosures. You have the foreclosures. Anne's got the foreclosures. I got the foreclosures. Learn how to search the public records. Also you know, that. Yeah, you don't yeah. get all the private info, but so. it's, it's gonna go on the market just like any other listing. But it's not just like any other listing. No, and in some ways it's better, and in some ways it's a okay. pain. <laughs> so let's just like walk through that. Okay. Down that road. So we go in, go to show property. What are some of the things we need to know? Uh, we're going to look at the showing instructions, which are going to probably have a whole paragraph of agent only remarks about things like maybe this property is protected by the first look initiative. I love stuff like that, you know, because most of my clients are not investors. I have one poor investor right now that this is actually kind of a, a pain about. But yeah. most of my clients are actually going to live in the house that they're buying, which is awesome because these bank properties, the banks aren't fooling around. You know, they generally price them pretty aggressively. And if they put it out there and it's not selling, they drop it until it sells, which is kind of a pain for people that have a bank owned house for sale in their neighborhood. And they're thinking like, oh my gosh, that's what my house is worth. No, bank, bank houses tend to sell for a little less. You don't think they do? Well, I was just going to say they do, but more recently, bank owned properties have started to really come up level with the rest of the market because, because of the they're demand. selling. Yes. For a while, they were markedly below the actual value in the neighborhood, and now they're either, in some cases, putting a little money into them to get them fixed up and financeable. That's true. Because then they can get more offers. Um, or in some cases, I've seen them where they sit for a month, and then they start just hacking away at that price. And so what's cool is when a bank mar when a bank home does come on the market and it has a good price and it's dialed in and it's ready to go, investors can't swoop in and like 
get, get the bank to give it to you for cash because they actually have a window of 10 days, 16 days that's only for owner occupants. And this is primarily with uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Right. That, that they've got, and there's a couple other programs, but those are the two big ones HUD. where, yeah, HUD, where you've got a program of 10 days to two weeks, somewhere mm -hmm. in there, where it's protected for owner occupants only. So great advantage for some buyers. And, and if you're an investor and you want to buy a bank owned house that is, that has one of those on it, you just have to wait it out. Yeah. And, you know. And it, and it may become available. So you go in, what's one of the other differences? There's sometimes the first look. Uh, sometimes the lights are off and the toilet doesn't work, so don't. Make sure you go before you, you don't do be that properties. person. Yeah, don't ruin it for the rest of us. Um, so the many times the utilities were shut down as part of the foreclosure. The property has been winterized, even though it's summer right now. They winterize the property to protect against leaks and things like mm -hmm. that. And it can take a long time for the utilities to get turned back on. So yeah. these agents that manage these properties, these bank owned properties, they usually are in charge of getting the utilities switched over. So you may write an offer on one of these properties, mm -hmm. and the utilities may not be on yet. What does that mean for your inspection? It just means that you might not be able to book your inspection as soon as that contract signed around. And if that's the case, I mean, I've had the situation where we're eight days in, and there's some old bill that they have to get paid off that they haven't been able to clear, and, you know, we're only now just getting the utilities on. I have never had a situation where a bank wasn't willing to extend because it was their fault. I, I mean, yeah. in that way, I, in my experience, the banks have always been pretty honorable. We've, we've reached a new normal where, yeah, you just they go ahead and know extend what's happening. that inspection period yeah. if utilities are not available. Because for not only your inspection, but also for your appraisal, you need to have... Appraisers require the lights yeah, on. and the water, water running, running to the faucets and the yeah. toilets and all those things. So um, even though the contract, and that's, that's probably the most major difference between mm -hmm. bank-owned properties and typical sales is that they're using their contracts, sometimes over top of our state contracts, sometimes in addition to, but because these banks are doing business maybe in all 50 states, they can't go by our contract. They the biggest won't. thing that you should know is going in, the contract is going to say you're buying it as is, you're gonna make some uh, compromises that you wouldn't typically make in a normal sale, and the yeah. assumption is that you're going to do this in exchange for a good price and the ability to purchase this property. And typically, they're gonna let you out of the agreement you know, if you don't like, say you do your inspection and right. you're unhappy, if the title has an issue with it, they are not, they're not trying to keep your earnest money. They just want to sell the property. No, but it's, it's just important to, to take an extra look at those pages because we're not trained on them. Right. You know, and we do our best to read them. But I've had clients get lawyers look them over. And, 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 that, and that is always explain advisable. It. It's, it's something that, that you should do because, you know, we, we, we are we get attorneys. No, and not only that, like I've sold, I mean, half the houses I've sold this year have been bank forms. I'm not sure I've seen the same one twice yet. Right. I mean, even when it's the same bank, they've got a new version, they've got a new rule. You know, before they were paying for resale certificates, now they're not paying for resale certificates on condos. Like, things change. Mm -hmm. People find confusing about buying a bank-owned house is that phrase, as is. They're like, Which is plastered in bold print throughout the contract. It's, the, it's you know, it's liability, whatever. So, I mean, in the state of Washington, nothing's ever really as right. is. There's no you, technical designation for that. Yeah, I mean, so if you need something done, you can always ask for it. But it's just important to know that with a bank... They're not gonna fix your light switch covers. They're not gonna. They're not gonna, you know, do anything unless it's a danger to you. Unless not, they, you know. Yeah, like I had one recently. I mean, they're not even like the toilet doesn't flush. Okay, that's your problem. They are that's not deep. concerned with those items. <laughs> no. And sometimes that you know buyers' feelings get hurt a little bit because uh, this house isn't ready. Right, and and that's something you need to know when you go in. So you get through your inspection. You get through your appraisal and you're heading down to closing, one of the other major differences is the closing time frame that's involved uh, because it's not just a seller who comes across to escrow and signs the hour after you do the nope. closing. No, nope. they got to send it off to the bank to and review. They, so you mean they've got to build in a little bit of extra time, and they are not very flexible about the closing date. So we're seeing, because of how much activity there is in the market, yeah. lenders are backed up, escrow companies are backed up, your uh, foreclosure, the bank that owns the foreclosure, they may charge you by the day. They have per day. Hundred dollars a day, fifty dollars. I've seen two fifty a day for going over your your closing date. Close on time. So there's not uh, flexibility in that part of the process either. Not usually. Yeah, yeah, and that varies. I mean, again, that varies widely with the institution that owns the property. They each have different policies, but generally speaking, there's not as much uh, latitude to adjust some of those details of the contract. So keep that in mind. Another thing that's different um, from a normal sale about closing 
is that um, there can be fees. And I've been doing a lot of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac lately, and they're just wonderful, and they don't charge for a bunch of stupid crap yeah. like that. But a lot of the banks do charge you a $250 rekeying fee yeah. to put, like, a crappy $5 lock on your front door that you're going to have to rekey anyway. But whatever, for liability reasons, they rekey the house, and then they charge you for it. And it's kind of snuck into the contract. That's what we're saying. It's not a normal part of the contract. It's added on there somewhere. But so all of a sudden, at the last papers. minute, they're like, where's our 250 bucks?" And you're like, yep. yeah, tacked on to your closing costs. Thanks. So there's a few of those things that will be different, but in most cases, it's well worth it. Pretty straightforward. And, oh, you know, one other thing to mention, something like Fannie Mae or yeah. Freddie Mac, these are actually government-owned. I mean, they feel like bank-owned, but it's, it's a, not government, I guess. Or, is this the government still well, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? I mean, yeah. it's such a weird, yeah. Frankensteinian situation. Anyway, so uh, they will actually provide financing. Can um, I go off on this road a little bit? Talk home path can, I, can I can I hop on that on the on the on the financing it's, train it's for a the pretty attractive option? So the cool thing is is they'll do no I mean the rate's a little bit higher, but there's no at least in our current, you know, it's summer of twenty thirteen. Right. The rate's that a little higher, nice. but there's no mortgage insurance. At so three percent down. Three percent down if you're so gonna live in it. If you're an investor, ten percent down. I mean it's crazy. And there's a rehab option within that program also, right? Yeah, I, I've never done that. I have it either. Oh, generally. Two or three kids. Word on the street is there's a it's not but it's not a two or three, it's a home path renovation. Right. It's like its, its own it's, crazy loan. But it's kind of comparable to a two. So or look, three we kid. don't know everything, but we do know who to ask. Anyway, so the cool thing about that is they will finance the property for you. There's no appraisal, it's very smooth, it's less expensive. That said, there is one little downside to that, and that is condos. So if you are buying a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac condo, and they are providing the financing yeah. for that condo. It's really important um, to know and to investigate on your own whether or not anyone else can buy a condo in that building. Because I've had the situation yeah. where the condo is not financeable anymore, and so somebody buys in. I mean, not not one of my clients, <laughs> obviously, God forbid. But you know, people have bought in on these home path loans, thinking, oh, it's easy to buy a condo in this building, and then they realize, oh. This is completely, it's cash only in this building until the building gets their act together. But right. because Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac was providing their own financing and it was super easy to get in there, they didn't realize that for most people it's actually kind of hard. And that was a one-time deal. So when they go to resell it, you're saying when they go to resell it, somebody else might not be able absolutely. to Absolutely. And it also, you know, a, a, the larger the variety of financing options available to a property... Money. The more buyers, which well, means the more money you can get. And the, because foreclosures are sometimes listed below market value, look, okay, <laughs> um, <laughs> there is something to be said. You've got to brace yourself in many cases for multiple offer situations. It's yes. a very regular part as a... a but can I say? Yes. I love the way banks do multiple offer situations. It's like everything else. It's very clean and oh, sterile. Oh, so nice because you're like, here's our offer. And they're like, whoa, doggies. There are multiple offers. And, and everyone goes... <gasps> And then they say, everybody get me your highest and best offer by noon tomorrow, tomorrow at 5 or, yeah, tomorrow at noon. And then you just know, I'm going to give it my best, the best I can do for this property. Right. And then we'll see how the cards fall. You don't have agents, like, being like, well, Susie says she can get up to what so-and-so, and, and can you do this, and can you reduce this? And it's just, no, everybody just does their best. And it doesn't matter if there's one offer in addition to yours or 10 offers. They just play it that way. And so if it's a new property, the, the reason this often... And no, you can't know what those other offers no, are. No, no, ask us That would you ruin want. the fun. Out. That would ruin the fun. And it's like, you've got to have it by this deadline, yeah. not a minute after, or mm -hmm. you miss your window. Um, so it's important to know when you're going in and checking a property out that you may be set up for that. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of brace yourself so you may not want to go in with your best offer, for instance, out of the gate, because on a lot of these foreclosures, you will be subject to the multiple offer scenario. Man, I've so. gotten back and forth one time with one, you know, I had an investor, and she was a friend, and we went back like four times. Through the multiples? Yeah, well, no, there was no multiple. Like, yeah. It was like, here we are, and they were like, we're up here, and we were like, it wasn't like with a normal seller where you, you were know. They're mad at you. We're like, you? eh, and they were like, eh, and we like worked our way to the middle, and we got there and it was awesome and that's you can't so, do that with the that's another big difference though because once they did accept your offer one of the things about uh foreclosures is they might accept your offer verbally on tuesday so say you're the winner True. of the multiple offer situation uh you submitted over the weekend monday they gave notice of highest and best tuesday they said or they said have your best offer in by tuesday at noon tuesday afternoon they pick you they say your buyer just mm -hmm. won the deal 
Uh, you may not have a signed around contract with everybody's initials on it because they're going to send their paperwork that their people typed up for you to sign as the buyer and then they will sign it after that. So there's a period of time there where it's just verbal. We don't have a copy of everything in writing for you. And it, it's just the way they do business. I've never heard of that going sideways. South. I mean, you would never in do that. In a regular that. deal, you'd never do that. I wouldn't. Nothing is verbal in real estate. I mean, we should probably, I mean, the Practice lawyers that. are watching. I mean, even with a bank, technically. But this is how it's done. But it's how it's done, and I, it's never fallen apart for me. No, me no. neither. Thanks. So, just a, you know, a few little nuances. Maybe you think you know how this process works or you've been through it recently. You have to be prepared for it doesn't fit within those guidelines. Things are a little, a little different. Yeah, little and, it, and it does, ha I mean, there are some things that are standard mm -hmm. for foreclosures you know, yeah. versus a regular sale. So there are some things that are predictable, like the multiple offer yeah. process, um, but all bets are off in some ways and they can make their own rules and they have their own contracts and if you don't like it, your primary remedy is to not buy the property. Don't do it. Oh, baby, give me one more chance.